and uh, the choir and our, our orchestra. It's just been a wonderful day of celebration. And once again, uh, let me just say to you that my hope is that you experience a joyful Resurrection Sunday. One reason is we are experiencing a winter season that's just hanging on, aren't we? I tell you, it's a little warmer today, but um, I had to cut off the weather person in mid-sentence this morning because she was starting to talk about snow again tomorrow, and I just couldn't believe it. But um, winter has been long, but I guarantee you spring is coming. Warm weather is coming. All those outdoor activities that you love are coming. And we're, we're getting a glimpse of it every few days that it's on the horizon. And that hope of spring and summer, you know, it just fills our hearts with, with longing and hope that's all ahead for us in the next few months. And you know, that's really one of the things that the gospel message of Jesus being raised from the dead is about as well. Maybe some of you, and if not right now, today, and in this season of your life, you've gone through a time when maybe you're experiencing a long winter in your soul. A long winter in your spirit. You know, you need some hope. You need some springtime. You need to be surprised in the joy and enjoy life and all that God has planned for you. So this Easter message today, it's, it's one that's been around for 2,000 years. But I hope by the retelling of the Easter story today that you can experience the joy of Jesus' resurrection. Maybe rediscover it. Maybe just praise God that, that you live with this joy every day. Or maybe if you've been contemplating that you need to accept this resurrection into your life fully. That's what today is all about. Well, before I retell the story, let's read it from God's Word. The Gospel of Mark, second gospel in the New Testament. And I'm going to begin reading with the 16th chapter. And the very first verse, the gospel says this, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you, trembling and bewildered. The women went out and fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord today. Well, let's relive and rewalk the steps that these women take that first resurrection morning. Now, the women are the same women who on Friday had been present around the cross, and they had witnessed Jesus crucified. They had witnessed Jesus dying. They had witnessed him coming down from the cross. They had witnessed Joseph Arimathea saying, I'll take the body and place it in my tomb for burial. They were there when Christ died. So they knew for a fact that Jesus, in their mind right at this moment, at the beginning of this narrative, they believed that Jesus is human and that Jesus was dead. There was no doubt in, his, in their minds 
Jesus had died a physical death. Friends, that's an historical fact. Now, I know there's been um, conspiracy theories through the years that have said, oh, you know, no, Jesus was still barely alive, and, and somebody, the disciples, or somebody came and, and resuscitated, resuscitated him those three days, and he came, and, you know, he snuck away from the tomb and started this whole movement that's been going on for 2,000 years. Well, that sounds pretty like a wild-fetched story to me. Because Jesus was dead. I love this little illustration I like to use sometimes. It, it's about a person that writes to a local newspaper advice columnist because he's confused. The columnist's name is Eutychus. It says, Dear Eutychus, our preacher said on Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that his disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely bewildered. So the columnist replied back, Well, dear bewildered, beat your preacher with a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours, and then just see what happens. Jesus, at the beginning of this Easter story, is dead, isn't he? No doubt about it. And so the women that morning, and I want to point out, it's the women. Guys, we don't do well in this story. We have run away and are hiding together, huddled in an upper room. The women love Jesus so much. They're so courageous, they had lost somebody that they loved, and they head to the tomb after they can go there, after the Sabbath. But they were also bewildered. Life was not supposed to go this way. They had been thrown a major curveball. You know, the one that they put their faith in, their trust in, they thought was the Messiah, special. It had not ended well. He had been executed. They didn't know what to think. They were lost. In the face of the harshness and the reality of life and death, what were they to do now? What were they to do next? Have you ever felt that way immediately after maybe losing a loved one? When we face death, we wonder that. What do we do now? So make no mistake, these ladies got up early that morning out of a great love for Jesus, but they were heading to a graveside funeral service. They weren't heading to a resurrection. Now, I think their experience is similar to, to those today who maybe you're here and, and you're first beginning to encounter Christ today. And maybe that's where you are today in, in thinking about Jesus. That, you know, you've heard about Jesus all your life. And, and, but, and you see Jesus as a man of history, a great teacher, someone you've heard about. But you're really not sure what to think or believe beyond that. Because right now, where you are in your thinking is that your human mind just can't get past Jesus being just a human being. You can fathom that he lived a, law, a moral life, that he was unjustly tried, that in great injustice took place, that he died on the cross. We've seen all of those things happen before. And like these women, you can grieve for Jesus, you can be angry if he was mistreated, and you're kind of holding your own personal graveside for this great man in your beginning days of meeting Jesus, of figuring out who he is for your life. And that's where the women were. They didn't know the resurrected Jesus yet. But then, some surprises begin to happen, don't they? On their walk that Easter morning, what they were most worried about was how are we going to get to the body of Jesus to anoint him with these spices we have. 
because they had seen there was this large, huge stone rolled in front of the tomb, and they didn't have the strength to move it. How were they going to get there? There was no door. Besides that, they knew, and the other Gospels tell us, that Roman soldiers had been placed at the tomb to prevent anyone from stealing the body and then coming up with some outlandish story that he had come back to life. So they were thinking about that. How is this going to happen? But they were determined, and they kept walking towards Jesus. And spiritually, we need to do that too. Even though you may be bewildered about him, thinking about him, not sure about you, keep walking towards him. Keep walking towards him. And they get there, and they're met by several surprises. Somehow, the large stone has been rolled away, and the door, the entrance of the tomb, is wide open. So that was a surprise. Then they go in. Oh, this is going to be easier than we thought. They go in with their spices to anoint the body. And instead, they are surprised. They see a young man in a white robe sitting at the right hand of the place where Jesus was supposed to be dead and laid out like a viewing you go to at a funeral home. Wow. That was a surprise. In fact, if you go back to the verses we just read, Uh, It says, they entered the tomb, they saw the young man dressed in white, sitting on the right side. And Mark, you know, he's very vivid, but sometimes he doesn't expound. He said, and they were alarmed. You think so? (laughs) You think they were alarmed? Would you have been alarmed? You know, me not being a strong woman, I'm a weak old guy, I'd have ran. You know, if I saw something like that. But they hang around. They hang around. They had just peered into a death chamber and found it empty. They had come expecting death and found youthful life. And and their grief and their bewilderment and their feeling of being lost and abandoned now turned into kind of questioning, shock, fear. What's going on here? In your journey to discover who Jesus is, maybe that's the stage you're at. And you bring those same emotions here, having some of those thoughts. As as you learn more about Jesus, maybe you started a a, a small group Bible study somewhere. Uh, Maybe you've been starting to attend church. Or maybe you found uh, some new believing Christian friends and and they're starting to talk to you about Jesus and, and their salvation experience. And you begin to realize somewhere in your spirit, deep down in your soul, that that, yeah, Jesus is more than a good man. He's more than a great teacher. He's more than a victim of lynching. And the stone in your heart that comes between your mind and your faith is beginning to roll away. And you're beginning to open up. And you begin to discover what the gospel writers and the first believers who saw Jesus risen are trying to tell you. You're beginning to to think and remember and know for sure, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus' death is real, but Jesus' resurrection is real too. You begin to realize that that death on the cross was was to take away your sin that separates you from a holy God. And you begin to look deeper into the person, the godliness of Jesus Christ. You're beginning to dare look into the tomb and, and discover that it's empty. But you're still trying to discover, what does all this mean? How can I put all the pieces of this puzzle together? What kind of godlike plans going on here? Something's happening. And then a reality happens that changes everything in this story. The women are startled to see this young man, but boy, they're really shocked by what he says, aren't they? 
first thing they, he says is, hey, you're here looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. You came looking for a man called Jesus. You came here expecting to find decaying flesh and bones. You got up this morning to stare the reality of death in the face and figure out how to overcome it. And then the young man said words, the reality that changes the history of mankind, the human race, and gives us hope forever. He says, you came looking for a body, but he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, and they begin, it begins to dawn on them. Jesus wasn't this other great man. He was truly the Son of God. The tomb is empty. There is no body because the Almighty God of the universe has raised him from the dead. That's Resurrection Sunday, isn't it? And because of the fact of this resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, re eternal realities became instant. Like the work Jesus did on the cross to give us assurance and confidence that now, because of the resurrection, grace is real. Salvation can never be taken away from us. We realize now God paid too great a price. Salvation is here forever. God's grace, because of the resurrection, we've learned and right at that instant, now has the power to change your life forever. For eternity. And the resurrection sealed the deal. It sealed the deal. It meant that eternal life is a reality. And that Jesus has given us the ultimate victory over the grave. Now Jesus has already gone from the tomb when the women arrive. And the young man next tells him something that's pretty amazing too. He said... Jesus has already gone ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus is loosed unto the world. Jesus is loosed unto the spirit of every man and woman, boy and girl, who ask him in. And Jesus continually goes ahead of us, preparing the way for us. He goes ahead of us into a future that we don't know anything about. A future that we think is defined by death and grief. Now he goes into a future that we can have joy. He's always ahead of us. I'm always amazed as, as a pastor, you know, trying to see what the Lord's church should be doing next. And, and we pray and we plan and we do something like an oyster roast or going to Peru. And there is God already ahead of us working, figuring it out, preparing the way. Jesus is loosed unto this world. What an amazing word that was. There was an old play by John Macefield. It was called The Trial of Jesus. And in his play, he has the, the centurion. Remember at the cross, the centurion that says, truly this man must be the son of God. Remember that part of the story? And in the play, he has this centurion going back to Pilate and Pilate's wife. And he, um, he tells them that about Jesus' death, that he's dead. He reports back. And after hearing his description, Pilate's wife says, Do you think he's dead? No, my lady, he replies. He's been let loose in the world where neither Roman nor Jew can stop his truth. There's no stopping Jesus now. There's no stopping him now. Now Mark says then that the women leave the tomb and they're trembling and they're bewildered as they ponder what's happened. They're so shocked that they're silent and they don't know what to say. But they would later find their voice. They would, we know, go tell the disciples. They would tell Peter. They would tell the world of the good news that Jesus has risen. And we still tell the story today, don't we? The truth. And they tell the story, no, Jesus hasn't risen as a man, but as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. How are you going to respond to the surprise and the joy that Jesus has been crucified 
and risen for you today? That's the question of Easter. Now, let me ask you something. If I was uh, up here and I was a medical researcher or a doctor, and I would say to you this morning, and I wish I could say to you this morning, this morning I've gathered you here together because I have found 100% cure for cancer in this world. Nobody will ever get cancer again. I've had it. It ain't no fun. Nobody will ever die of cancer again. Any of your loved ones that are now suffering from it, I've got a drug right here that will cure them. And nobody will ever have to deal with that dreaded disease ever again. And I say, now, all you have to do now, because I'm a, a pharmaceutical guy, I might have to say, you know, I'm going to ask you in just a minute, if you want to come up and get this, this, this drug, this medicine, that you'll never have cancer, and everybody that you know has cancer will be healed, all you have to do in a minute is come up here and I'll give it to you. Now, you may have to show me your insurance card, because i got to make a little money on this, you know. But when I say it's time to come, how many of you would come up and get that drug and get that cure? My guess is there wouldn't be anybody left in these seats. Just like that. You'll come, right? Hey, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Easter says, I've got a better deal for you than that, don't I? I can guarantee you, I have got the solution. I've got the heal. I have the promise that you'll never have to worry about death again. Because you know what happens if we destroy all the cancer in the world? The death rate's still 100%. Because that's what the Bible says. I've got something that you'll never have to die again. That just as Jesus rose from the dead, you can rise from the dead. Your family will rise from the dead. And we'll live forever in glory. And all you got to do, you don't have to show me your insurance card. In a minute, I'll say, come on up if you want this free gift of salvation. Free. And Jesus will give it to you. And you'll be saved for all eternity because of what he did for you on the cross and through the resurrection. Now, how many of you are going to come on up here? Why wouldn't we run up here as quick or quicker than that other? I don't understand it. I guess it's our human nature. But it's a greater cure than curing all the cancer in this world. Just a minute, we'll have a invitation hymn we call it here and I'm going to invite you if you don't know Jesus to respond how do I do that you say how, how can I accept this Easter story I'm at the point where the ladies are now at the end I, I'm, I, I believe he lives and I need that let's bow our heads as we pray I encourage you to meet and pray to the risen Jesus. If you're a believer for a short time, a long time, many years, you can just pray silently right now and thank Jesus and give him praise for being alive and saving your soul. But if you're here and you need to make that first response to Jesus Christ, that you need to accept this free gift, this eternal life, this salvation, and I encourage you to pray and ask Christ in your heart. And how do I do that? Well, you can pray a prayer similar to this. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and died for my sins on the cross. Lord, I believe you rose from the dead to conquer death and give me eternal life. I humbly ask you to forgive me of my sin and enter my life. And I'm going to do my best, Jesus, to make you the Lord of my life as long as I live. Thank you for loving me, dying for me, being raised for me. In Jesus' name, amen.
Boy, if you've never prayed that prayer, and today's the day you prayed it, and you really meant it, this is amazing too. The Bible says Jesus comes into your heart, saves you. And then what he wants you to do, and here's the invitation. We think it's a tough part, but it's not. I want you to come down as we sing this song. Tell me that you prayed that prayer. I'll pray with you. And we're going to let everybody here, most everybody here, believers, know that. We're going to baptize you. And boy, you heard us do a little clapping after the songs today. We, we do some mighty big clapping after baptisms because it's a fun day. If you don't come up today and you think about it, if you're listening to this message on a radio next week, you call the church and you talk to one of our pastors and you come and find me. These are eternal decisions this morning. They're joyful, but they're eternal. Let's stand in joy as we sing our hymn of invitation this morning.